that anyway, and that will give all of you who are already here the chance to ask whatever you want, <laughs> and, uh, um, and also for us both to get to know each other, uh, ourselves and Mary, Mary and myself and yourselves to get to know each other. Welcome along. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you, thank you. And Tamworth. And Tamworth. It is very cold. <laughs> not used to that. No, it's not cold. <laughs> Appreciate, appreciate you coming all this way down. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Glenn. Thank yeah. Thank we've, what we've done is we've travelled from um, from our home. We went across to the Sunshine Coast and we spent a weekend doing two talks there. And then we we've, we've come down um, in and we stayed with some friends at the Gold Coast and we finished up having a little meeting with some with with some people there. And then we travelled further down to Byron Bay and we've met with some friends there and then further down to Coffs Harbour and uh, met with a friend there and stayed overnight there. And then we've travelled down to Gosford, which we caught up with a group on Sunday. So we stayed at Gosford a couple of days. And then from Gosford we came across to here where we had a... But we broke up the travel a little so that we had a night off in between. So, and then we arrived here yesterday. And then after this session, tomorrow we leave... And we go back to a. We've we've got this little romantic getaway thing <laughs> planned for one night um, uh, near, in the gold, near the Gold Coast, and then uh, we're back in Brisbane, and we're doing a whole weekend in Brisbane, so two talks in Brisbane, and then we go home, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can I ask where is home? Home is about um, it's northwest of Kingaroy by about forty kilometres, so it's in in a it's a bush block with. 40 acres and it's very plain uh, Michael and Suzanne have been there so they can tell you what it's like but it's a, a fairly uh, it's fairly arid Queensland uh, block but but not uh, that arid that there's no water around um, we both love it because it just means that we can do whatever we want wherever we want and however we want without there being any external pressures which is great for emotional processing work so it's really good yeah, um, we've got some visitors come up from Tasmania, um, which is the reason why we're going home. And my parents are actually visiting us for the for for the second time in the last thirteen years. So that's quite a special event. Um, so they they are coming up uh, sometime next week or the week after as well. So um, so we've got quite a few visitors awaiting us back <laughs> back back home. Yeah. Now, we've talked to a few of you about how you learned about all of this. So it's funny how things happen, isn't it, with how you learn about different things. Some of you have learned about it through Peter's Alpha Dynamics stuff, and then others of you have learned about it from friends and so forth. But um, we just want to firstly just welcome you all along and, and want to encourage you to ask any questions you feel you would like to ask. Uh, whether we can answer them or not will depend totally on how we feel. I was having a nap and suddenly woke up and realised you were all coming, so I'm a little bit dazed <laughs> still. Yep. We were both having a lie down before you came and, uh, and we just went off. <laughs> and uh, then woke up at, uh, a few minutes before the first person rocked up in a bit of a daze. So. so we're sorry if we're not quite as lively as perhaps we would normally be. We'll warm up, we'll warm up. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, what we'd like to do is just open this session to yourselves because we know that many of you have not had the opportunity to ask any questions and uh, maybe some of you would like to ask some questions p about your personal situations. Others might like to ask us some questions to, to get to know us a little. And so feel free to ask anything um, that you wish and uh, we'll attempt to answer whatever we can um, in the best way we can at this mi moment. Someone's brought a book, that's a good, <laughs> good thing. Can, oh, oh, away, Meredith. Um, you always use the microphone, though, and all just speak right into it. Yeah. That's it. Uh, can you hear? Yep. <laughs> I do have a question. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions, but uh, I have some um, concerns about knowledge that's been given to me of, of my biological father, who I don't remember having known. Uh -huh and he has passed, I found out after he had passed, um, I, I actually located a lady he married later. Yeah. So I've been told a few things, probably um, not to my satisfaction, it seems too painful for my mother to speak of. Yeah. 
I don't know if they it was the truth of what she told me, but then she would go no further mm -hmm. and has tried to avoid, even though I've said to her, but you don't haven't told me anything. She said, oh, I've told you everything. And I said, no, you haven't. Mm -hmm. I want to know mm -hmm. things like, did he like this, did he like that? I don't know, want to know his life with you so much, which there's some of the things she did tell me that were very horrible things for her possibly and too painful. Yeah. So there's some issues regarding that and in that question too I had an experience probably uh, must be close to nearly 10 years ago now and after I had met this new wife of his and she spoke of him when he passed it had happened sometime just after I feel this experience was at night and I'd woken up to go to the toilet and then I got this feeling there's somebody in the room there's really somebody here uh -huh. So I went to the toilet and I came out and I just stopped. I thought there is really somebody in the room and then something passed right through me. Right. There was a really, really cold sensation on my back and it felt like it did pass right through me yeah. and I could feel like heat drawing off me. Yeah. So I was wondering, one, was that him trying to contact me after him passing in some way or some other? All right, well let's, let's yeah. let address some of these issues too emotionally for you as well. Yeah. Um, so firstly, Meredith, you're quite mediumistic. Right, right, okay. Part of being mediumistic is learning how to trust yourself. Yeah. Every time you ask me whether I feel something's happened to you, <laughs> that you already suspect has happened to you, but yeah. you're not trusting, yeah. that's, a, that's an emotional issue for you to work your way through. Okay. So why would you want to ask me a question of something that you already suspect and feel quite strongly is true? Not trusting myself. So you're not trusting yourself. Is yet. that from a lack of love of self? It comes from a lack of love of self, but it also comes often from our childhood where, you know, we had some mediumistic experiences. We told mummy or daddy about the mediumistic experience. They told us, no, it's all a bunch of lies or you're just trying to make it up or whatever else. And that causes an emotion to enter us. And before we know it, we're not trusting ourselves anymore. Yeah. And the key is to work your way through that lack of trust of yourself emotionally. So, so more and more lately, while I can confirm events, I'm resisting the process of confirming events okay. because I would prefer to see that you actually come to trust yourself. When you trust yourself emotionally, what will actually happen, and, and talk a lot in, into this communication with God, what will happen over a period of time is that every single question you could ever ask will get answered. Yeah. But not because you're trusting another person to answer yeah. it, but actually the answers will become will come from God directly to you. Yeah. But it takes time because every emotion within us that's in within us unhealed prevents us from either asking the question, yeah. listening to the answer, or yeah. doing something about the answer at, at the emotional level. Yeah. So if you can allow yourself firstly to trust, yes, that was your father. So this is what you believed. So trust that for the moment and then enter into a dialogue you, with him. So he's there, obviously, in the room, or, and obviously he can come again at any time he wishes. At the time of the um, incident, I didn't know that it was him. I knew it was something had gone through me. But, but you've later. felt since that it since was him? I, yeah, when she told me of his passing, and I went, I wonder if that experience, because it came up in okay. my mind. So trust, trust those, trust uh, those intuitions, okay. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, trust okay. that. And now ask that, ask him to come back again and have a chat with him. Yeah. You have the ability to do that, so have a chat. I'm with a bit him. scared about that because at times I've heard things. You're and, afraid and of what are you afraid of? Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what I'm going to find there. Um, okay, so you're afraid of what things might be triggered inside of you emotionally. Yeah. One thing yep. that you're afraid of is that maybe Mum is lying to you, and then you'll have to deal with a whole set of things with Mum. So yeah. that's one thing you're afraid of. Another set of things you're afraid of are things like. Um, I might hear some truths from him which will trigger me emotionally and upset me yeah. and you're a bit afraid of that and yeah. then you're also afraid of where he is now and, and, and yeah that too yeah wondering that because of what I've been told um, and I guess like I I understand how you say the damage the soul damage done from our parents but yeah. we still tend to want to protect our parents don't we yeah, yeah. And, um, that, and that's the emotion that's going to be triggered through this transaction Sooner or later you will learn that you don't have to protect your parents. All you need to do is speak truth. And I vacillate feeling at times, am I being cold-hearted to let see people sit in their own pain and, and vacillate thinking, am I thinking too highly of myself? And then, oh no, what is my real state? 
So yeah. there's this um, to and fro there. So, so a lot of that is not trusting yourself, are uh, yeah, it, it's absolutely. Not even yep. trusting Thank whether you. your own feelings are actually pure in nature or, <laughs> or insincere, are they? Yeah, no, you're not absolutely. even trusting yourself there. Yeah. So the key is to start allowing yourself to see what's going on inside of yourself on yeah. this path in particular. So the Divine Love Path is all about connecting with God and then allowing yourself to feel all of your emotions, no matter what they are, and stop judging them. The biggest block, and this probably applies to everyone who's here, the biggest block that we have with regard to feeling our emotions is we ha have a layer of judgment about our emotions. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to feel that because of... I'm not allowed to feel that because of... I'm not allowed to feel that because of... And, and while we have all of those I'm not allowed to because what's going on inside of us is we're shutting down the emotional expression. The key is to understand that God doesn't judge any of your emotions like that. Mm. God just wants you to feel them and if they're in error they'll be released by the feeling of them. If they're in truth they'll be enhanced by the feeling of them. So the key is just allow yourself to feel them. Whether they're error based or truth based, that feeling them is going to have a positive effect on your life. If you're judging them before you feel them then you block off that entire process. Yeah, I'm just wondering how far I've shoved them down. I had a, a in doing journey work with Brandon Bays, a huge meltdown. I didn't even know what it was about, but I just went into a fit of crying and, yeah. and weeping and carrying on, and I was so weak after it. And I really can't imagine what it was about, and it was it just, it just hit me. Yeah. And it was just spasms and spasms and spasms of these just yeah. grief, absolute grief. grief. Like I hit something really deep. But I didn't know what it was. But it doesn't matter. No. And what will happen is that, like if I could describe a little bit of what's happened through my own process, and maybe Mary can describe a little bit for her as well. With my own process, even before I knew who I was, I started doing emotional work. When I, during that process, I had lots and lots and lots of memories. Memories about abuse, torture. I had a memory uh, about people nailing nails into my feet and all sorts of things none of which I could, I could understand. I didn't understand any of them. I didn't link it to myself being Jesus or anything like that. All I did was have these series of memories that went on for years, like for seven, seven year period. And at the start, all I did was I thought, well, I must have been abused as a child or something. Like I didn't, I didn't believe in reincarnation. I didn't believe that, you know, I believed spirits could influence me, but I knew spirits weren't because I, I, because I don't feel connections like that with spirits at all. And, and so it felt like my own stuff, but I couldn't understand it. So I went through this period where I, I tried to understand, you know, here, but that just shut it all down anyway and made it all worse. So I had to give up that. What I tried to do is I tried to say to myself here, uh, what would it be? Could it be this? Could it be that? Could it be this? Could it be that? Many of you have done the same, right? Yeah. Could it be this? Could it be that? Could it be this? <laughs> and, and, and in the end I realised that every time I was going, could it be this? I wasn't allowing myself to feel it until I resolved here what it was. So I, so I had to give up this process of trying to know intellectually what this emotion was actually all about and what the memory even was all about. And instead just allow myself to feel the emotion or memory. So I went through this process and a feeling one after the other after the other, all sorts of things. Lots of it related to torture and abuse and things like that. All which I then assumed must have happened. I, I'd never believed in past in a, in a life that I had any longer than the life I've lived this life. And so I just assumed that it must be all to do with that. And then I, um, after I came out of all of that, which took a period of nearly seven years, um, I was used to now not judging my own emotion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Not judging it, not trying to define what it was, <coughs> just feeling it for what it was. And then what happened is I went through a whole process of remembering who I was. And once I went through all of that process, I realised what all the other memories were all about. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But up until that time I had no idea what they were all about. And I didn't even try to work out what they were about. Because every time I tried to work out what they were about, they st these memories stopped me, my emotional flow. I, I was out of my emotions when I tried to do that, and I wanted to stay in my emotions. So what I found out through that process uh, for myself was that every time I attempt to intellectually work out what my emotion is, generally I'm doing it because of another emotion. 
of fear about what it is. Fear about, you know, what, why am I having this memory of torture? What's, what's up here, you know, and worrying about all of that. And when you start to relax emotionally and just allow yourself to feel, you will not want to know, know necessarily what it's about. And the iron, irony of that is that down the track, after you've had a series of different emotions occur, you will go back to some of these emotions that you've actually had and ah, now I know what that was all about, right? Because everything starts, your soul has a complete memory of everything that's ever happened to you. And so eventually what happens, when you release the emotional blockages to remembering everything inside of you, you will remember everything and you'll know what it's about then. But you won't know while you're doing it. And a lot of people are expecting themselves to know while they're doing it, which actually slows down the entire process of doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Best to just give that up. Can I just ask one last question? Do you think my father ever tried? Did he deny me? Did he not want me as well as I was told? Well, that's the emotion driving your quest to connect with your father. So you need to feel that emotion. Okay. Me giving you an answer is only going to get you out of that emotion. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So what's the emotion? The emotion is my father didn't try to find me, my father abandoned me. There's some of those are kind of emotions in there for you, right? Allow yourself to feel them. And when you do that, you'll find you'll attract probably your father, even if he's in the spirit world, and he'll be able to answer those questions directly for you, right? And wow. you may find out a completely different set of truths yeah. of what actually happened. You, you may find that your mum rejected him. You Two may, sides to every coin. Yeah, yeah, you may find the truth to the matter. But first feel your emotion before you ask the question. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes. Ask yourself, what emotion is driving me feeling this? And it's the emotion that your father abandoned you. Let yourself feel that your father abandoned you. It may not be true, but let yourself feel it because yeah. that emotion is, is in there? you. Yeah. Does that okay. make yeah. sense? Yeah. And to be frank with you, that emotion could have come from your mother who may have been abandoned by her own father. Yeah. rather than actually your actual biological father abandoning you. Yeah. But it doesn't matter where it comes from. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's actually in you and needs to come Felt in the out of you. And, yeah. Yeah. and Mary, would you like to mention some things like of your emotional journey in terms of not knowing things and then and then feeling them? Yeah, it was a big it was a big thing for me to let go of the need to understand everything before I felt it, because um, it felt very out of control. To suddenly, when I first met AJ, I suddenly started to have a lot of emotional experiences that I couldn't rationalise and explain, um, <clears throat> and so I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out say six months or eight months trying to figure everything out before I'd allow myself even just to connect with what was already there. Um, it's, and, and that I think is what you're experiencing, isn't it? There's something already there, but you're really wanting to check everything out before you give yourself permission to, to go into it. Um, and I had to learn to just go into whatever's coming up, whenever it's coming up. And um, I've had the experience of things suddenly, while, even while I'm in the emotion, the truth of what is actually occurring or what has happened comes to me. Yeah. But I have to be willing to go to the emotion first. Yeah. 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 That's good. Good question. Um, over there. You My question is, where um, does knowing or trusting begin and delusion or schizophrenia? take over. <laughs> okay. Um, firstly, can I explain schizophrenia and what that really is? Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, delusion and what that is. And then we'll talk about knowing and trusting and what that is. Um, schizophrenia is actually a spirit, uh, a spirit uh, connection state. So when a person um, has a degree of mediumistic abilities within themselves, um, there are often quite a number of spirits surrounding them at any one time. Now, when those spirits surround the person, the person get, can actually connect to those spirits at any point in time. And they will hear those spirits often as a voice in their head. So a voice in their head tells them something. And that voice in their head that they're hearing, the doctors will often say, or different medical professionals will often say, has been created by something going on within themselves. 
But the reality is that actually these people are quite mediumistic and a spirit is connecting with them, telling them things. Now often the spirits connecting with them are telling them things quite damaging. Uh, things that may even finish up to be quite harmful with themselves. And we need to understand why spirits connect to us uh, at any one time. And it's all to do with our soul condition. What is our collective emotions causes an attraction to our friends, but also causes an attraction to our spirit friends. Now some of our spirit friends, we could say, are not that friendly. <laughs> in the sense that they've got lots of unhealed emotions in them too and then they want to act out those emotions through a person on earth who's mediumistic. So schizophrenia is actually spirits talking to a person. The reason why most of the medical profession feels that's a delusional state is because they don't recognise the spirit world. But that's what's actually going on. And there's plenty of ways to actually um, work this out by actually speaking with the spirit and finding out when they lived, when they passed, all these kind of things, but most people in the medical profession don't go down that track because they feel that, it, that, that it's heightening the person's delusion. Whereas my suggestion is talk to the person in that state like they, like they are a spirit, find out details about the spirit, when they pass, what they pass from, you know, what kind of you know, passing they had and so forth, and you'll actually find a lot of the underlying emotions that cause the attraction between the spirit and the person who's undergoing the problem of schizophrenia. So that's schizophrenia, in terms of a nutshell. There's a lot more I could say about it, but that's sort of like a summary. Delusion is a state where we believe falsehood even though truth is available to us. Now, you could pretty much say that all of us are in a state of delusion, if that's the case. In other words, there's certain things right now that you believe to be true, but God knows are completely false. Right? So how many of you feel that the world is a dangerous place, for example? That's a pretty popular belief, isn't it? The world's a dangerous place. And if we base it on our personal experience, for many of us, the world seems to have been a dangerous place. Does that make sense? But from God's perspective, that's our delusion. Our delusion is created by a heap of circumstances and situations that occurred due to emotional injuries, usually in our parents or in our environment before we even arrived on the planet, that caused us to then, and caused our parents firstly, to attract certain things into our life, painful events, and then, of course, those painful events had their own creations within ourselves, and before we know it, we're now attracting painful events. And so now we believe the world to be something that God never created it to be. It's really our delusion. I'm not saying that it didn't happen to us, what I'm saying is that it could be, we could be in a totally different place if we were in a different space inside of ourselves. So delusion is the state of not fully understanding the truth. Firstly about our universe and then secondly usually about ourselves. Now the problem with delusion is very subjective. So what you feel is delusional God might actually feel is actually truth. And how do you validate one above the other? There, are, there is a process you can go through, but most people on earth wouldn't recognize the process. And so most people then judge certain things as delusional and some things as not. So I've been quite often called delusional um, <laughs> as a result of that because everyone says, well, he's saying it's easy. He's got to be delusional, right? <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's true. It just means that that's a person's assessment of what they feel based on their own emotional conditioning and their own memories and their own thoughts and their own feelings. None of you know what emotional memories or memories that I've had. None of you know what I can rec recount from my life unless you ask me. And, and, if none of, and if you already go in with the state of saying, oh, that person's delusional, you won't even bother asking, will you? When you think about it, you've already made a judgment. And so delusion is a lot about judgment. So let's flip then next to the state of trust. You can really only trust something, and the trust is different to a state of faith. And so maybe we need to talk about faith, trust, and what was the third one? Knowing. Knowing, yeah, knowing. So um, I'll illustrate firstly faith and knowing in terms of in terms of how we can tell the difference between the two. Um, the Wright brothers, who created the first flying machine, if you like, that was powered, 
they had a feeling within themselves based on their understanding of different laws of the universe that they believed they could create a flying machine. Now they didn't, they hadn't at that point created one and in fact nobody in their own circle or their own <coughs> recollection had actually created one. But they believed within themselves that they could create one and so you could say that state was a state of faith. So what they did was they got together a heap of scientific research and all those kind of things and then they come up with their own ideas and they were driven by their own passion and desire in fact and they then decided, something decided inside of themselves that, that they might be able to do something that no one else had ever considered doing. And you could say that that's a state of faith. What the beauty of faith is, is that it actually allows you to dream about possible future things that you can actually make come true perhaps. And I say perhaps, because you don't know whether you can make them come true at that point. You just have faith that you can make them come true. And in fact, the Wright brothers had so much faith that they spent so much of their resources making that happen. And so faith, in fact, has been the major cause of change in the human race. Every technological advance that's ever, been, that's ever happened here on Earth has occurred because somebody firstly had faith that could occur. Does that make sense? Now the instant they got in their plane and they powered it up and it started rolling and then it's eventually it took off the ground the instant it took off the ground faith was transformed into knowing does that make sense from that moment on they knew they were right the faith wasn't needed anymore they had proven the truth not only to themselves but also to anybody who was previously ostracizing them right so there so you could say, let's look at it from an external perspective. Initially, most people around them would have thought they were delusional. <laughs> but they had faith, this other quality, this quality that something in the future could happen. If I learn about it and discover more about it and or do all sorts of research about it and put it into practice, experiment with it and so forth, it can happen. They had this faith. But at the instant the plane lifted off the ground, they had knowing they knew now that they were right and nobody could convince them any differently after that. Now you know that they were right because you yourself have probably been in a plane or at least seen one flying and know that the whole principles that, that they were dis in the process of the part or part of, they were a part of discovering, you now know are actually true. What they discovered really and proved was the law of aerodynamics. This other law, greater than the law of gravity, that no one really understood much of before then, but now they had some proof that it existed. They were now knowing. Now, that's a bit different than trust. Trust is very linked to faith, but faith really is about the future, isn't it? It's like saying to myself, sometime in the future, I feel this particular thing will be possible. Right at this moment, I don't think it's possible, but sometime in the future I feel it will be possible. You could say that that's faith. Um, in the Bible the Apostle Paul said it was the assured expectation of the things hoped for. In other words, you had a hope of something happening in the future and you were quite assured that you would get to that place. So that's faith. Trust is actually about a state right now. What the Wright brothers had to do was to trust their intuition. There was nothing else for them to trust at that point, really, aside from a few things they had researched, but they had to trust themselves and their intuition right at that beginning point. So you can see that faith is really about the future. Trust is about what's happening right now. Can you see the difference? So, so they had to trust that in the future, if they, that, uh, that if they followed their intuition, they would be able to continue with this idea which was the faith that in the future they would be able to create this flying machine and when they created the flying machine and it first flew now they had knowing now they knew for certain they were right does that sort of answer your question Thank you. sorry is, isn't, uh, uh, can we go through the microphone because it sorry. yeah it's just a just a little thing on that knowing yeah. that's all 
um, yeah, just on the knowing, uh, isn't there a deeper meaning to knowing as well? Like uh, before you even see that something has happened, you can have a feeling of knowing um, on, a, I, on a spiritual sense. I would call that faith. Because until you can actually prove it, it's not a knowing. But isn't, um, isn't that more in the science, in the <coughs> proving of it? Um, when, you know, not so much in the spiritual? No. In the feeling it, of Everything knowing? spiritual can be proven. Absolutely everything spiritual can be proven. So s sooner or later you'll find that all the things that I've been presenting to you through DVDs and so forth, absolutely everything, one of those things will be able to be proven to you. So this law of attraction, the law, you know, law of cause and effect, law of desire, you know, the, the principles regarding reception of divine love and all those different things, they can all be proven to you. When it's proven to you and you're actually in the space yourself of living it, then you'll be in a space of knowing really. Before then, you're really in a space of guessing, right? But often what happens is the knowing that we think we feel is actually the knowing that a spirit has who doesn't need to guess anymore. They've already been through it all. They already know it through their own experience and they give you a feeling of knowing. Does that make sense? So oftentimes what we in a spiritual sense talk about as knowing is actually a spirit guide giving us this sensation that we know. And the proof of that is that often we get these sensations that we know and then we go off and doubt it. Right? Now, if we really knew, we would not then doubt it. The spirit knows and doesn't doubt it. And the reason why we doubt it is because there's some kind of emotion being brought up within us. Does that make sense? So the so-called feeling of knowing that passes through you at times. So many of you, when, I first, uh, when you first watched the first DVD and I said, I'm Jesus, many of you had this knowing feeling pass through you, which later you come to doubt. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Some of you, that's the case, right? <laughs> and, and that happens all the time. So the knowing feeling has actually come from a spirit guide or a spirit friend of yours giving you this feeling of what they believe and it passes through you. When you have your own doubt, it means that it wasn't your knowing. Because when you know for certain, you will no longer ever doubt. So do all our feelings come from uh, spirits? Um, no, no, no. All of our feelings come from our soul, but a spirit can work with our feelings and project feelings towards us. It's a bit like you with, with a husband or a partner. You can actually have your own feeling of love for your partner, but you will often sometimes feel their feeling of love towards you and to you. That's their feeling passing through you. And the way God made us all is that we have feelings that we can transmit to others, if the other is unblocked towards that feeling, will pass through the other person. And the same applies with spirits in their interaction with us. They can have a feeling which they projected us, and if we are open to that feeling in that moment, that feeling will pass through us. And we'll feel it almost as if it's our own feeling, but it's actually the feeling of the person being transmitted to us. And in fact, that's how God is with us too. God has feelings for you, which if you're open to them, can actually pass through you and you will feel them to be coming outside of yourself but actually passing through you and and this is all part of all this the real soul interactions we have are all these kind of interactions this beautiful feeling that we c I can send a feeling to you it can pass through you if you have the openness to allow that particular feeling so many of you have felt this with say something like rage or anger where somebody gets really, really angry at you and they're projecting all this anger and rage at you, that you can feel the feeling bombarding you, can't you? And sometimes the feeling passes through you and what happens is your own anger and rage starts and, and then you're in a state where you're now back, <laughs> angry back with them, right? And even though that wasn't your intention at the start, you know? And that's because there's a resonant feeling going on inside of yourself that resonates with that feeling and that passes through you and then triggers something inside of you which then you transmit to others. So the key is to not view everything as like a separateness. We are in effect, all of us are all connected emotionally by this transmission and reception of feelings. And, and often if your feeling will pass through me if you have a feeling about me. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I will feel that feeling as if, you, as if it came from myself, but once I've worked through the emotions, I will know it came from something outside of myself. Yeah. Does that make sense? And... Thank you. I'm Donna. Um, I've got a few questions. Far away, one's Donna. about the soul. Yeah. Okay. Before we come here. Before we're created. Before the it. incarnation. Thank you. Yeah. No All right. Um, you mostly answered these questions many a times, but I don't know it. No. So number one is, how does the soul split up? Okay, if they're t as one. I know that they do divide, but how does it split up and how was it created? I and mean, where is it? Where is it before it... Before, you know, where, where is it out there? <laughs> out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. out there. Maybe it's winding around. Yeah. Okay, well, there's three questions there, not one. But anyway. Oh, there's, there's three of all, just one. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, the so let's look at the whole soul before it splits into the two halves and before it's ever had a personal experience. So in other words, in this state, it's a state of being as well as a place of being. In this state, what happens is it does not have a consciousness of itself. It doesn't know how to use its free will. It has a personality, but it's not conscious of that personality. In other words, it's not self-aware. So that's the state it exists in. For how long it exists in that state, there's been many souls in that state for millions of years. So it just floats off, floats around. There's a dimension, there's a dimension in which they exist, and th that dimension is in the 22nd sphere dimension. It's in a soul union state in the 22nd sphere dimension. When you get into that dimension yourself through your own progression, you'll be able to actually see those souls. But you won't see them with eyes that you've got right now, because they're uh, physical eyes, right? You'll see them with a totally different sense, that is a part of the soul. And the question you've asked has a lot of uh, very technical answers, of course, right? And what I'm going to try to do is simplify it enough because in, in the future what we'll be doing is demonstrating the science of it all in a lot more complicated detail when people are ready to actually start conceiving it in a, in a, in a, in a scientific manner. But at the moment, if you could just... Uh, We'll give, we'll give a very simple presentation so that, so that we're not bam bamboozled with science in the process, right? The soul itself, in this state, you could liken to, you, in your own conception, and, it's, and the reason why I say that is because when you're in this state, in the 22nd sphere state, it's totally different than what you could conceive it to be right now. In fact, um, anything above the 7th sphere is actually very, very difficult for the majority of us to understand while we're on the earth until we get into that state. The reason why is the, the, the transition between the sixth sphere and the seventh sphere and the eighth sphere is so great that by the time you get to the eighth sphere, you no longer have a mind. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've watched, I've right? seen that. Yeah. And you no longer use your brain as a mechanism for determining anything. Everything is, used, is, is based on the soul's brain. The soul's brain is your emotions and your passions and desires and longings and all those things that are part of your soul. Now, your soul has the ability to determine truth very rapidly that your mind has no capability of understanding. So until you actually make the transitions of the soul, most people will never even be able to conceptualize the seventh dimension, let alone the 22nd dimension. Does that make sense? But you've got me... <coughs> caught there because you are the one that went and created the 22nd sphere so yeah. there's no way my soul could have been there <laughs> if it wasn't there. No, your soul was there but in an, what's called an unindividualized state and when you say the 22nd dimension, a lot of these dimensional spaces have already existed right? You're the first to get up there. Yeah, and, um, and, so, right. so, and God, so God created the potential of the 22nd sphere being created does that make sense? Yep. And while I say the soul union state is the 22nd sphere state, it doesn't... Um, what I, I'm not saying that the soul union state, when you're in the pre-incarnation state, I'm saying it's like the 22nd sphere. In the sense, you're in this state. Remember I talked about it being a state, not yet a location. So it's a state of union of the two soul halves. So it's the same kind of state 
as the 22nd dimension state, although not in the 22nd dimension, it's the same kind of state. And when you're in the 22nd st sphere state, you will be able to actually physically also see the dimension where these souls in the same state before they're incarnated exist. Does that make sense? No, for resonance, so we can perceive. You will perceive and see uh, with the soul sense of sight, which is actually far greater than your eyes sense of sight or your spirit body sense of sight. And we'll talk about those things uh, maybe separately. Now in this state, which is, a, and, and obviously the location of this state surrounds the earth itself. Right, so so they're in this state of this soul union state, but it's a pre-incarnation condition in the sense that they are not individualized. They don't know they're in that state. Does that make sense? Yep, 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 yep. And due to the law of attraction, every one of the souls in this state exists surrounding the earth. The reason why they surround the earth is because they're waiting for the incarnation process to occur. Right, so the location in which they exist, in terms of space is around this earth. Does that make sense? Yep. But they're actually in a state of soul union, but it's a pre-incarnation state, which means they're not conscious yeah, that yep. they're in that state. Yeah. Yep. And when they incarnate, that's when they split into the two halves. And the two halves are defined primarily by what you would call masculinity and femininity. Yeah. And so the splitting of the state is not about uh, it's about splitting all sorts of capabilities. So Mary has certain capabilities in her half of the soul that I don't have. Like Mary has a natural uh, sort of direction towards language. I find language very difficult to, to assimilate. I have a natural direction towards mathema mathematics and science. Mary has a less of an interest in that. <laughs> so put these two together and it's one whole. That's right, you put yeah. these together and it's one whole. Um, like Mary has a lot, a lot of different qualities in her that, in terms of helping her feel things a lot more strongly that, uh, than I do at times. And, so, so, and I, have, I have less of those qualities. So, you know, we, we are basically two halves of the one soul, but each p half has a different proportion of each quality. Right? Now, how the soul splits is completely dependent upon how God designed the soul to split. Do you follow me? So, so I can't answer how the soul split because I don't Everyone's even have different. enough... Well, I, I don't even... Even in the 22nd sphere state, you don't have the knowledge of how God even created the soul yet. All you know is that the soul exists and it splits. Yeah. And, you, and this is how it splits and this is why and all those kind of things. But you don't know how... God actually created that soul. And I feel that as one of the future things that we'll be learning, not as something that I currently know how to do myself. But it's one of the future things that I feel the entire of humanity will eventually learn to do, is to actually create little souls, if you like, yeah. that will split and go to an, another earth in this universe and, and said, done, have its own experience. The With the DVD on animals, same thing, we create our own animals if we want to do... Yes. Same type of... Yeah. Well, it's a similar concept. Now, I understand a lot more soul. about creating an animal than I do about creating a soul. The reason why is the creation of an animal is a, is a process of the creation of a spirit and material body. So if you create an animal in a spirit world, it's the creation of a spirit body. If you create an animal in the physical world, you're creating an animal with a spirit and material body. And there are a lot of spirits who know how to do that. Right? So yeah. in your own existence in the spirit world, you'll find out how to do that. In fact... I feel the majority of you will find out how to do that on earth if you go follow the divine love path. And that's a whole lot different than creating a soul. The soul is like the pinnacle, if you like, of God's creations. It is such a complex thing because the soul has so many characteristics and attributes that it's so in, almost impossible to describe to, to us in, in our current state, even in my current state. For example, just, some, just to give you some concept, the soul in its natural state can only progress to the sixth sphere. In other words, if the soul hasn't received divine love, the two halves of the soul can only progress to the sixth sphere. They can't go through a soul union. Right? Mm -hmm. divine, it's divine love entering the two halves of the soul that, that trans transforms the soul into this new state where they can now go through the process of a soul union. Now, 
I don't know why that happens. I only know that it happens and I've done it. But I don't know why it happens. I don't know how the intricacies of how God created, and this is at the moment with my current memories, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, so obviously there might be emotions in me that I need to release and I'll be able to answer the question in the future, but right at the moment, I don't know how that happens, how this divine love actually transforms the soul. All I know is that it does do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I can remember it happening to me. And it, it's and sort it of does like you it. purified yourself enough to both of you, both souls, to be able to go, okay, we can join together. That yeah, but it's not thing. purification of ourselves because it wasn't due to any personal effort of ourselves. It was because of divine love entering our soul that caused this transition. So the soul, when divine love enters it, transforms the soul into a new creature. I don't know how God designed that. I, I still don't understand how clever that design is. Yeah. I just know that through my own experience that it happens. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. And, and so it's such an in intricate design when you think about it. You're created one way. It's a bit like being created and you're, and you're a caterpillar. And then all of a sudden there's this little transformational process that occurs and you're a butterfly. Now how did that occur? Yeah, right? right. And, it, and this happens at the soul level. And, uh, and so it's very, very difficult to even understand how God actually created this being, if you like, this soul, that even splits into half and then can combine again and it can be transformed through receiving divine love. All we know and all the spirits know is that it actually does happen. And when you actually put it into practice, experiment with it, you know it happens. The best way I could liken this understanding is like, scientists right at the moment do not understand electricity. Mm. They don't understand really how it happens. They understand all of the different intricacies of all different ways that it can be created and all these different things and they have very, very uh, large amount of theories that, all, that they feel might, are true because they seem to be replicatable but they still do not really know how it happens because it, the more they delve into the question the more uh, the more answers or more questions there seem to appear and so the more they delving in another question comes up I don't know how that happens you know and then they spend years even finding out that and then and then you get into the start getting into quantum mechanics and that just opens a whole mm. you know, huge you know sounds like the chase and yeah tail. yeah because because the 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 world we live in the way God has created is so complicated but it's also so simple when you get to grow in divine love, you start actually being able to put things into practice that you yourself do not even have to understand. Does that make sense? You just do it. It's it a bit, happens, yeah, it's a bit like, who's seen the movie August Rush? Have any of you seen that movie? Oh, it's worth seeing. It's about this little boy. He's never played a musical instrument all his life until he's about, what age would it be, about nine or ten? About ten or something like that. He's given a guitar, and within five minutes, he's going and playing the thing like, yeah. And then he's given the idea of notes, and he writes a symphony, right? And it, if and while it's a fictional story, it's actually what the soul's like. The soul is like this that it, you know it understands a lot of things that that you can't really understand why it understands it. And, uh, and, and if, you can un if you can allow yourself to conceive of that, you'll start understanding why the intellect is such a powerless tool to understand all of this soul, the soul things. Is that similar to what you were saying about emotion? Is that just allow it to go? Just, just cry it out, do whatever you're going to, and then all of a sudden it's just going to come and come back yep. and go, and then you've got it. Yep. Similar type of concept? Similar type of concept yep. to that, yeah. And, and you'll notice that some people naturally do this. Like, how many of you have noticed a sort of like a child prodigy? Like, you've ever seen one who's, who has this bent towards mathematics that nobody seems to be able to understand, and nobody really understands why, but this child, by the time it's five or six, can understand mathematical equations and formulae that the average person in university can't even understand. So how does that happen? They're like those young kid, kids with the mental yeah. disability, but they can get bang. That's right. Uh, mathematical yeah. calculations, just like that. Yeah. That, that we that's need a, autism. That we need a computer to to do. And um, why do they know how to do that? Well, there's a whole capacity of the soul 
that we're detuned from emotionally and that particular person isn't detuned from it emotionally and so they can connect to it and do whatever they want with it. And it's the same in music, it's the same in art, it's the same in mathematics, it's the same actually in lots of fields of endeavours. Yeah. Thank you. I've got more, but I'll ask later. Yeah. Give someone else a chance. Um, I didn't. I don't know if I've answered the entire question about the soul uh, incarnation oh, process. <coughs> but if you can, uh, if you can understand that when the soul incarnates, when it splits in half, the dis the split, if you like, if you can think of it like an egg splitting in half. Yeah. And as it splits in half, the way in which it splits was actually predefined by God and it will always split that way. So in other words, if m when myself and Mary first incarnated, we weren't conscious of our own existence, so this was 2,000 years ago, we weren't conscious of our own existence, we split in half, Mary went into a feminine body, I went into a masculine body, and we split in exactly the same way. Does that make sense? The second time, we split in exactly the same way, with exactly the same characteristics in each half. However, there are certain things that we can swap in the second incarnation. We can actually swap memories. Oh, cool. right? So the characteristics of the soul are still going to be split in the same way, but the memories in which we experience, we can take differently. So I've taken some of Mary's memories from the first century, and I had them as memories. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Which was a bit confusing, because it mm -hmm. felt like I was a woman having these memories. <laughs> but but, but after, after a while I understood what was going on, just by allowing all the emotions to flow, and then I could remember the event. Does that make sense? Yeah. Completely. And then I realised actually that was my Ma Mary's event. And so that, that also happens as well. So everybody splits differently? Everybody? You guys could read, like, everybody yeah. splits differently, but if you reincarnate, you'll split the same, the same way as you split before. Different. Yeah. Two souls, yeah. yeah, so in other words, you won't Our split and you so. become a man and, and your soul yeah. mate, whoever that is, becomes well, a woman. If that's the female, they're going to still be the male. Yeah, yeah, male, male, depending female, on... Female, exactly, yeah. that's exactly correct. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, microphone, if we can ask questions. <laughs> so, uh, any memories um, of a past life for a male who uh, has the memories of a female they are from the other half of the soul. Is that right? If if there is a second incarnation and the person has part and, and the person has remembered all of their life, so you have to remember your entire life from your first incarnation onwards, then yes, any memories you would have in the second incarnation would that's related to being a woman would be related to your soulmate's memories. However, in today's in today's stuff about reincarnation, the majority of the time that's not the case. Remember I've said quite clearly that reincarnation only began since 1962, right? And the reason why that's the case is that that was the first time anybody reached the soul union state to in reincarnate. So how do then we explain the fact that I, as a person on earth, then there's been, this has happened time and time again, right? Where people have had a series of memories of a life here, a life there, a life here, a life there. Some of those memories are women life, some of those memories are me as a man, some of them me as a woman. How, do I, how does that happen? Well, the answer is that it's all to do with mediumistic connections with spirits who are surrounding you. So a spirit surrounding you has had that memory and they're actually giving you that memory and experience. Now, there's a number of reasons why they do that. The main reason why they do it is they want to connect with you. And they're basically saying, here's my life, here's who I was. I was this person, this is how I died, this is when I died, right? And, and then you say, oh, I must have been that person in previous life. And they go, oh, no, no, <laughs> I'm trying to tell them who I am, you know what I mean? Like, and so if you actually interact with that memory as if it's a spirit, you'll find you'll find a lot more about the memory than you would if you just thought it was your own memory. This is why a lot of people have the memories of specifically mostly their <coughs> passing, you know, how they passed, but they don't have many other memories of their so-called previous life. The reason why is that they didn't have that previous life. A spirit's trying to tell them who they were and how they passed. Most of the time they're trying to tell them how they passed so they can get some help about like, how to progress. 
but we then interpret as, oh, that must have been a previous life, and the spirit just goes, oh, fair enough, and they go on to another person and, and want to connect with them in the same way, do you know what I mean? And many, there are literally millions of spirits in this state going from person to person to person to person until they get a person who will listen to them, right? And then that they can enter a dialogue with. And this is why you have 500 people remembering they were Joan of Arc. <laughs> or a thousand people remembering they were such and such a person. Judy. Right? Yeah, like ten no, millions of people remembering not me, right? <laughs> uh, because, they, because in reality, most of them aren't remembering these things. They're actually telling them experience of their life. And many spirits come to us every single day. And if you're in a spiritual state on earth, in other words, you've been investigating spirituality for years and years on earth, your spirit body will be brighter than the average person's spirit body. If you've developed morally and if you've developed in love, your spirit body will be a bit brighter. Also, you're more aware intellectually that there are spirits, right? That automatically creates a law of attraction that spirits want to respond to. And if a spirit's in desperate need of assistance, what he will do is he will try to get your attention. I, you know, how does he do that? the same way I would do it if I was in the physical with you. Come up, shake your hand, say, I'm AJ, who are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Here's, here's a bit of a description of my life. What about yours? You know? And this is all the spirit's trying to do. Exactly the same thing. And then we then go down the track of interpret it totally and totally different. And that just sends that then they feel quite disappointed. Most of the time they feel quite disappointed inside of themselves. And often they move on to another person. If they don't move on, they often feel very connected to our emotions. So in other words, I might have some emotions of being downtrodden and hurt in my life. That will connect to a spirit who's being downtrodden and hurt in his life. And while he gave me some pictures and I didn't recognise them to be you know, a different person than myself, he's still connected to me because he feels for me. And I feel for him. And he recognises those feelings. But if you can treat them as a spirit, you'll find you will be able to enter a dialogue. When you enter a dialogue, you'll be able to actually assist him, but you will also assist yourself because there's a law of attraction, an emotional reason why this spirit is attracted to you. And, you will assi and both of you will be assisted by the interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a... Actually, I do have one more yeah, question, on. if we can, AJ. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Out-of-body experiences, really, really vivid. You know, um, what hap what's going on there? Yep. Well, that's all You're going out of your body. <laughs> 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 um, it's very possible just to connect to your spirit body and, and go for a, a wander around and, and see what's going on. Uh, all of us do that when we go to sleep at night. Um, we often go off and have other experiences. Um, and some people are just able to be more conscious of it than others. Mm. Yeah. yeah. This was after a, after a, an accident years ago. Yep. Um, I was up there looking down what was all happening, and yep. and then everywhere I thought to go, I was there, and that's that it was yeah. really yeah. different. Really awesome, eh? Yeah. That was that's really that's, it. that's exactly yeah. what your spirit existence is like, like that. Yeah, come pick me up next time. Yeah, come, <laughs> come, come figure up next time. You know. the, the, if I can explain a little more detail, why it's so vivid. When you disconnect, when something's gone on trauma-wise or, uh, or you're stepping out of body, this happens, as Mary said, every night, you're now using your spirit body's senses, not your physical body's senses. So your spirit body has eyes and your spirit body has a brain, your spirit body has ears, your spirit body has a mouth. Every sense that you have in your physical, your spirit body has and additional ones on top of that. And what you're doing is you're now having all of your sensory inputs into your soul are now via that spirit body. And that's why it's so real, because it is actually a real thing. You're actually doing this really, but in your spirit form, not your physical form. Does that make sense? So your physical form is just laying down or in the accident or laying on a hospital bed or, you know, maybe even just lay going to, laying down ready to go to sleep at night and your spirit form lifts out of it. And the soul is connected to your spirit form and your spirit senses are now heightened because it's now the active, sense, it's the, the active interface to the world. And so you can see everything in the physical and you can see everything in spirit as well. That your soul condition will allow you to access. 
So for some people it's a very scary experience because their soul condition is afraid or they have different fears they yet to resolve at the soul level and so they have a very scary experience. For others they're less afraid and the more, you know, they, they feel more feelings of, uh, you know, no fear and they yeah, have a better the, experience. I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to go back in the body. Yeah, yeah, I, most I people wanted feel to that. stay there. But, but whatever it was, I had to go back um, and I can't understand why. Um, yeah, we all. The only time, the only time you will leave your spirit body, your physical body, permanently, is when the silver cord gets cut. So what happened with yourself is there's a silver cord that joins your spirit body with your physical body, and that cord, which is actually a, all of your sensory apparatus, is a connection between the sensory apparatus of your spirit form and the sensory apparatus of your physical form. And while that remains intact, you are drawn back to your physical body. Right? And when you say, I wanted to go, but I, but I couldn't, and most of the time there's a mixed desire occurring. At the soul level, often if we have feelings of unresolved feelings about our physical existence, when we have the opportunity to pass in the state like you had, um, you often will not choose to pass as a result of these unresolved emotional experiences. And some of it can be unresolved emotional feelings of life purpose, that you haven't accomplished your life purpose yet. Does that make sense? And so there are feelings that you have within you that causes you to go to, to either stay in the spirit world and separate from your spirit, from your physical body, or reconnect, um, you know, re-enter your physical body. Remember, you're always connected to it until there's a separation of that cord, that's that silver cord. But this brings up one more question: is um, <laughs> how, how do we know what our life purpose is? Okay, can I just go back to the previous question, though, because there's something more I'd like to say about it. Um, most people, when they pass, as soon as they pass, if they're not passing into a dark condition, the majority of them would never ever consider coming back to Earth. See, the majority of us, we are usually, we, the majority of people on earth are afraid of death. But the instant you die and pass, the majority of people are in a fairly sort of average condition, if you could say that, like in the spirit world. And the average condition in the spirit world is much better existence than what we even have here on earth. In terms of I can go anywhere I want, whenever I want, I can interact. I don't have to eat food anymore, so I don't have to. I don't have to have a job. I don't have to. You imagine that? You just give up your job. Wouldn't that be a good life? Like <laughs> where you didn't have to have the job, you know, just stuff like that. Unless it was something you desired, and all of a sudden you start acting on your desires. Just that alone causes most people who have passed to never want to come back to Earth ever again. Does that make sense? So the majority of people, when they have these out-of-body experiences through trauma, never want to come back to Earth for the same reason. <laughs> yeah. And the, so, so the spirit world is something to look forward to. It's not something to, to, to run away from. The majority of people are very, even if they know about the spirit world, still feel that their life here on Earth will be better than the life in the spirit world. And that's not always the case. And in fact, for, for many people, it's not the case at all. It depends on your soul condition, though, how enjoyable it's going to be. So if you've done a lot of damage on Earth or you've got some soul damage of your own uh, due to choices that you've made that have been disharmoni uh, disharmonious with love, obviously the pleasant experience turns into a more painful experience. And that's what causes the majority of people who are so-called earthbound to stick around the Earth, not wanting to go uh, to new locations in the spirit world, because the majority of them are afraid of what that location is going to look like. Does that make sense? Yeah. How do you know your, like, know your life's purpose? We were talking about this earlier with, uh, with you, Dave, weren't we? Like, it's, it's not that easy to know your life's purpose. Um, the best way to know your life purpose is work on, re on removing all of your fearful emotional conditions first. Within each of us, we have we have a unique personality uh, as a, as our soul. It has a unique personality that's not the same as anyone else. So, um, this idea that when we all reach at one, we'll all be somehow zened out and blissed out and exactly the same is actually not true. As we get closer to God and grow in love, we actually become more unique in in a loving way in what our 
unique qualities and attributes and our desires and passions are. So for yourself, your passionate desires, which for most of us are untapped as yet, because we have so much fear, um, but yours will be quite distinct from mine and AJ's. Um, ours will be quite similar because we're soulmates. Um, so for yourself and your soulmate, as you grow in love, your passions and desires will seem to come closer and closer together. But for, for most of us, because we have so much fear, there's a lot of expectation as we grow up, we, we very quickly as children lose touch with what our passions and desires are. So, yeah, so for, for most of us, some of us are fortunate to reach adulthood and still have a burning desire for something and love to go to their job and <laughs> do what they do. <laughs> but for the majority of us, it's a process of, and for myself personally, it's been about um, recognising and releasing my fears that, that has brought me closer and closer to what my passions are. Because it's, it's sort of, they're the limiting factor. Once the fear is gone and you can, like if you imagine winning the lotto, what would I do? And I, but then you have to think, and I had no fear, that would, would <laughs> you know, that what would I do then? And for, for a lot of us, we can't even feel what we would do then because the fear is so instilled in us. Yeah. Yeah. So once you release a lot of these fears, you'll be left with your passions and desires uh, as the most prominent thing. Once you're left with your passions and, and desires, you can then develop them, and they can be developed in any way like possible. So it might start out with a little small burning desire to do some art that you never ever done all of your life until you know you, you retired and then you, you realise, oh, I've got a bit of time on my hands now, it'd be nice to do a bit of art that I've always wanted to do, right? And then after a while the passion becomes like, a, why wasn't I doing this when I was 20? You know, that, that kind of thing. And, and that's often how it happens for us in discovering a passion and desire. The reason why Mary's brought up passions and desires in the question with regard to my life purpose is that God doesn't actually have a purpose for you specifically except that you follow your burning passions and desires. And that will actually be your life's purpose. So God created us as a unique individuals, every one of us unique, and every one of us have unique passions and desires as a result of that. And when you express those passions and desires in harmony with divine love and divine truth completely, that's when you become the best possible creature you could have ever become. And that's the creature that God designed you to become. But it's about activating your free will to become that, if that makes sense. So in the first century, in, in my late teens, I started connecting with my passions and desires. And I started realising that my passions and desires were all about like illustrating love to the world like and going and and in fact i had what you would call the messiah complex if you like right um, in the sense of yeah i was delusional after all right and the, and the and the messiah complex that it's called nowadays that i that i felt inside of myself is that i wanted to demonstrate that man could have this unique relationship that i knew at that stage and i could start feeling at this stage was real that every single person on earth could have this unique relationship with God. And then I started realising that that was actually my foremost passion. And all I did then was just follow my foremost passion. Does that make sense? And that became something that then changed the world in a lot of ways. When you follow your foremost passion, that will also change the world in a lot of ways. Does that make sense? But it will be a different way than my foremost passion changed the world. Yeah? Yeah. Um, up the back, thanks. I just wanted to ask, is this working? Yeah. No, I just wanted to ask, uh, how do you, what do you see is going to happen to the way the world is now, the way humans are, the earth? I mean, we're in a, a mess. Right. And I'm just wondering. Is that coming through? Yeah, Paul? just to hold it a little closer. Just wondering what the plan is, you know, sort of what you see will happen to okay. humans and the earth. <laughs> so, your emotion is? What's your emotion? Um, if you put it... Sorry. Um, You're worried about the world? Well, s yeah, worried about humanity in general, I guess. Good eh? you know, I, I don't see us as having a great future. Okay, so that, that's <laughs> part of the worry, okay? So when we ask these questions, it's really good to identify the emotion within us that's caused us to ask the question. 
So if we can identify the emotion first for yourself, it's this worry that the world looks like it's going on this sort of downward spiral that it seems to continually be going on, which obviously will affect your future and the future of your children and, 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 and a lot of things around you that you value, right? And so there's a bit of fear there about what the future will bring. So if you can recognise that, that'll help you process some emotion about that first. <coughs> So that all being said, let's give you an answer for the question. Now, the problem with giving an answer to any question is that it has a tendency to alleviate our emotions that we need to get into. So one emotion that you will need to get into, even with me giving you this answer to this question, is this fear you have for the future. And it's a very personal fear that you have about the future, instilled in you from your own childhood and your own events in your life that you need to allow yourself to connect to. So. The reason why I can prove that to you is if we ask how many other people in the audience actually have a fear about the future, if they're honest with themselves. How many of us feel that fear about the future? About half, or a bit more maybe. How many of you feel like you've got no fear about the future of the world itself, or the earth, and the people on it? You don't have fear about that. How many of you feel that? Right? So there's a few there who don't feel that. So why do some of us feel it and not others? It's because of some emotional injuries that some of us have compared to others. Does that make sense? That we need to release. That being said, what will happen to the Earth is a whole different answer. So what we're afraid of happening to the Earth and what will happen to the Earth are two different things. What will happen is that we'll go through some cataclysmic times um, caused by the soul condition of man which is actually caused by the emotion of fear. So because of the fears that we have, that the majority of mankind have, that's creating a whole series of events actually on the earth and to the earth that will cause the earth to go through major changes over the coming years. And those major changes may even result in the passing of quite a number of people on earth. When I say quite a number, it might even be up to a half of the people on earth who passed during these times of change. Now, it's our f we need to understand it's our fear that's creating these things. Right? If we're in a state of love of the earth, these things wouldn't be created. Now, when I say love of the earth, I don't mean some fictitious, you know, some sort of hairy, fairy, spiritual love of the earth. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where we actually act lovingly towards the earth. So many of us feel we love the earth, but if you analyse what you do on a daily basis about actually loving the earth, sometimes it's very different to what you feel. Does that make sense? Because many of us can get into the state of saying, oh, you know, I would really like to love the earth, but I need to earn some money this week. Can you see how our fear about being provided for kicks in our desire to earn money, which then kicks in our desire to actually harm the earth sometimes to earn the money that we're earning. And I'm talking about the actual actions we have towards the earth and how they affect the earth, not what we hoped we would have towards the earth. So many of you may still eat meat, for example, right? That has an action towards the earth. Many of you are probably not aware of that action towards the earth, but it's not a loving action towards the earth. And it's something that you'll need to allow yourself to work through emotionally. And you'll see after some time that it's not a loving action towards the earth that you're feeling when you actually eat meat. But you do it because of some fears that you have. Well, if I, eat, if I don't eat meat, you know, my body might deplete. I might have this protein problem. I might have all these other issues that come up physically if I don't eat meat. So we go down and eat, we, we eat the meat. But it's actually not a loving action to the earth. And the proof is that it actually takes 20 times more resources on the earth to produce that meat than it did if you just ate vegetarian, for example. So I'm just saying that as an aside to show how most of the time many of us feel we love the earth, but actually our actions are not in harmony with what we think we feel towards the earth. And it's the real feelings we have towards the earth that are actually causing the damage on the earth. Does that make sense? Now, that damage will continue until the majority of people <coughs> change. And, uh, and until the majority of people change, God's put into place this auto-correction system. The auto-correction system is like a feedback system. When we do damage to something, that thing does damage back to us. It's called the law of compensation, if you like. 
And what happens is the law of compensation acts upon us and then we realise, wow, that wasn't a good thing that I just did. Because we saw the negative result. Does that make sense? And what's going to happen on the earth is there is going to be a lot of negative results due to the destruction that we are actually placing upon the earth. M emotionally, as, uh, primarily, but also physically as a result of our emotions. So what will happen is the earth will go through this transformation period where there's this feedback system coming back upon the human race, if you like, and then us as a collective group of humans will start changing. We'll start realising actually we're the creators of this problem. And once we start getting into that zone where we start understanding the responsibility, the Earth has a great chance to get into its beautiful state where in a, a couple of generations from now, there will be everyone on the Earth living in harmony, no more wars, no more... Like, you won't even make war instruments anymore. Like, the, the whole process of even doing that will be gone. Does that make sense? and we'll get rid of a lot of the fears in the process of this transformation that's going on. We'll connect with our emotions and we'll release a lot of emotions that are damaging ourselves and the earth. And in this whole transformational process, we'll end up in a totally different condition, the whole of humanity. Some of them will be in a natural love condition and some will be in a divine love condition depending on their choices. But everyone will be in a love condition. Yeah. Sounds like utopia. Yeah, it will be. <coughs> compared to what you have now, certainly. It will be utopian. Now, then we can go down the track of, oh, that's just a delusion. <laughs> right? But no, that's my faith that I have for the earth. Right? That's my hope for the earth. And the more of us that have the hope for it, the more it will become a reality, just like the Wright brothers had the hope for building an aeroplane that fly, and it became a reality through their desire. Yep. It always go, it's already begun happening, as you know, and it's all going to happen over the next probably 10 to 15 years. The major changes will all occur. There'll be some major cataclysmic events on the Earth, major changes to the world's ec economy, major changes to our governmental systems, and all of these things will all happen very rapidly due to a lot of different triggers. Some of the triggers will be spiritual in nature, like the teaching of divine truth becoming more and more well known on the Earth, and some of the triggers will be physical in nature in the earth giving us the feedback that we're harming it. Yep. So how accurate is the Mayan? Oh, sorry. So, Mike Ryan. How accurate is the Mayan calendar? Um, well, it's pretty accurate when it comes to these changes occurring. Um, a lot of people are worried that, you know, December, what is it, the 23rd or whatever it is, 2012 means the end of the world. Well, obviously that's not the case. God created the world to exist for a lo long period of time and the earth does go through cycles and the earth core itself goes through cycles but all of the cycles that it goes through are very dependent on the condition, the soul condition of man. Because you think about it, if you knew how to predict an earthquake, just that one thing, predict an earthquake, and everyone around you could also do the same thing, then w the first moment you could feel those, what are they called, the, the pre-tremor, the pre-tremor um, force field, if you like, which are low frequency vibrations, you would be able to feel that in your body and know that an earthquake's about to happen, you just put yourself in a safe place and wait till the earthquake comes and goes. So you wouldn't pass in that process. Now you imagine if the whole humanity could do that. <coughs> You know, these so-called natural disasters would all just happen seamlessly. No one would worry about them at all. You then think on top of that, well, let's say we're in a space of love, all of us, and we all cooperated when somebody were, was being harmed. So let's say we were all in that state. So if this house all of a sudden got damaged by the earthquake, a lot of our friends would get, well, we'll get there and we'll build a house. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or we might say, no, it was probably the wrong place to put the house. We might put the house somewhere where there's not as bad a quake or something like that, right? And we'd do that automatically. There'd be no fear in us. There'd be no uh, feelings of the money involved or fear that we not have enough funds to do it or none of that, you know. It would all happen seamlessly. And this is what's possible in the future and this is what is highly likely going to occur because of beginning and beginning with many of your desires which you already have and when you connect with God more with them you would actually really connect with those desires and make this uh, a real thing rather than it being just a thought in your mind 
And so all of you will be a part of the creation of that. Yeah. AJ, will it only be environmental or will there be war or on, a, on a world basis? I mean, in other words, is there going to be another world war? Mm. Yeah. Um, bigger than, what, bigger than what we're seeing now. Uh, yeah. Um, it is very, very difficult at this point in time to predict exactly what is going to occur. There are many spirits in the spirit world who believe there is going to be another world war. And so many of those spirits are channeling to people on earth that there is going to be a world war, right? Uh, there are also many spirits who believe there is going to be some other major cataclysms on, on earth uh, that are natural, more natural or environmental. And they then channel to the different mediums that they connect with about those particular events. The problem with all of these channelings is most of them come from natural love spirits. And natural love spirits are not able to calculate the effect of a soul condition. And in fact, they don't even believe in soul condition, let alone be able to calculate its effect upon the earth and also upon different events. And for that reason, it's very, very difficult for them to accurately predict what is really going to happen. To, to accurately predict what is really going to happen, you would have to know the soul condition of every single person on this planet so there's six and a half billion people on this planet, you would have to understand the effect of every single one of their soul condition. You would also have to understand and, uh, and see the effect of and understand the effect of every single earthbound spirit who affects the soul condition of a person on earth. And you would also have to understand the effects that it's already had on the earth and how far the earth can cope with these effects. Now, when you think about the computational power required <laughs> to put all of that together, there is actually not a single person who exists in the universe, aside from God, who can calculate those effects. Now, as a result of that, there is not a single person who can accurately predict any of these events. That being said, there are certain predictions <coughs> we can make with a certain degree of certainty. Does that make sense? And some of those predictions can be about the environmental effects. Some of them can be about war and so forth. But understand that every time you get into a state of fear, you actually create the effect being worse. So every time you hold on to your fear, remember, state of fear is not just an intellectual state. It's an emotional state, usually from your childhood experiences. So every time I deny my fears, I'm actually making it worse. What I need to do to make it better, whatever it is to make it better, I need to feel my fears and then feel what's under them and release that emotion. When I do that, I will be making it better. Now, because the whole process of predicting that is difficult at this point, it would be impossible to really say that in five years' time there will be this world war in five particular event. Can you see why? There is just so much required to make that calculation. But that being said, we can say at this particular point in time that certain things will probably occur. And, and many of the things that these spirits are channeling are based on those kind of calculations. So it's possible there will be world, a world war, if you like. It's possible. And I feel that if more and more people find the divine path, it's highly unlikely. It's possible that there are going to be some cataclysmic earth change events. If more and more people follow the divine path in certain locations, it's unlikely that those events will badly affect those locations. So it's all to do with your law of attraction based around your soul condition as to how it's going to personally affect yourself or anybody else. So my suggestion is, rather than worrying too much about what's going to happen, which is highly unpredictable given all of the constraints that I've just listed, you are far better off changing your soul condition so you can have a positive effect on what is going to happen. And that would probably include dealing with your fear about possible earth change events. <laughs> exactly. Rather than building a bunker. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And remember, your law of attraction is, such, is based around your soul condition. So if I have these deep fear of, of getting harmed during earth change events, what's a high likelihood of occurring? 
th that it will actually happen because the law of attraction is there to trigger the emotions to be released. So if I deal with that fear right now and release that fear and release the underlying causal emotion that creates that fear, what's the likelihood of it happening now? You've changed your law of attraction. Does that make sense? And really in the end that's all any of us can hope to do is to actually change ourselves which will change our law of attraction which has a positive effect on the earth anyway. And so rather than discuss um, like obviously I have feelings about the events that will happen at this point in time rather than discuss those events which for many of us will just create fear you'll be better off looking at all right what's in motion within me what kind of can I deal with this emotion what kind of fears are they and as Mary points out digging out those fears which will actually change the intensity of the events or the location of the events or the events altogether hmm. I think so just Just on that very briefly, so it's it's a little like Gandhi said, uh, "Be the change you wish to see." Yes, very much so. Yeah, because it, if you be it, you remember your soul is your being. Hmm. So if you are being different at the soul level, which is your emotions, your desires, your passions, and all that change, if you are different in your being, then everything around you will be affected by the change in your being. Yep. Yep. And a question on, on processing your emotions. Um, each of us has our own particular situations in life. Uh, for me, I have a wife and four children, uh, aging, ranging in age from 7 through to 16. I imagine um, the best time to start processing your emotions is probably now. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. But in a, in a practical sense, um, how can the, the everyday person actually actually start processing their emotions but still take part in, in the real world and, and still handle their responsibilities? Uh, well you won't like my answer very much. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that the answer is still now. <laughs> Deal with your emotion now. The reason why is remember it's your emotion that's affecting your so-called real world. So, so, you know, most people ask this question of how can I be practical? Well, actually, when you think about it, your so-called practical right now is the result of effects of emotional conditions that were previously not dealt with, right? That has caused a lot of your pain or pleasure, of course. It, you know, there might be pleasurable experiences you're experiencing resulting from, your, from a soul condition too. But the instant you change your soul condition, your world changes. And, and it's, you, you'll be able to prove this to you once to yourself once you feel it. So why delay the processing of your soul condition for any so-called practical reason? Because the most practical thing for you to do is actually change your soul condition right now. Right? We were talking about this sort of last night, weren't we, guys? Like how you know we were asking some practical questions about like business, for example. What's happening in your business right now is a result of your soul condition. It's not a result of the recession and it's not the result of all these other, it's a result of your soul condition. So the fastest way for you to change what's happening in your business right now is to change your soul condition, not deal with the effects of your soul condition being in a different direction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You see, most of the time what we do when we go down this practical road is we're actually dealing with just the effects of something that we're not changing at the causal level. If I don't change it at the causal level, then I'm going to keep getting those effects. And so how pointless is that to my life? It's quite pointless. That's why life gets really tiring because we're trying to <laughs> manage all of the effects. If we go for the causal straight away, things change really quickly and it's almost like a relief. Yeah. And the processing of those emotions, it's from, from what I've heard and, and read, it sounds, it, it involves mainly crying. I, is that the case? <laughs> What's your emotion about crying, Dave? <laughs> A practical one, I suppose. <laughs> um, it depends on the emotion, Dave. So um, if it's fear that you're processing, then you probably may not cry, but you may be shaking and trembling and that your fear, that's how your body releases fear. You see that in an animal when it's scared. 
it, it goes into this state where it's shaking and trembling and that's the state that we go into when we allow ourselves to feel the fear and um, if it's if it's shame it might be a different feeling it might be waves of heat like shameful heat it might be sexual shame or other types of shame and you'll feel these waves of feelings of, of disgust that pass through you that you may not be crying about you you will just feel these feelings of disgust and shame passing through you if it's uh, anger if it's childhood anger you need to release then you probably want to be in front of a punching bag and just yelling and screaming and swearing and bashing the bag if it's sadness or grief then yes you are going to cry guaranteed um, so there is all different types of responses yeah. it's it's usually always a bodily response that accompanies the emotion because most of these emotions were shut down when we were children that's how they became causal emotions so the whole process of emotional processing is really just freeing that energy if you like or that emotion that we've stored for so long that creates our law of attraction so it's it's always going to kind of look childlike in its expression because that's how it was formed and stored yeah. So it's just about allowing the emotion to come and, and just allowing it to run its course. Yeah. yeah, and most of us don't do that because we have judgment about emotion. And that judgment about emotion also entered us from our childhood because you think about what our parents did with about our emotions. When you cried, and you cried for five minutes, for most of us that might have been allowable, <laughs> you know, in our childhood. But when it was 15 minutes and it was going on too long for mum or dad to cope with, what would they then say to us? I'm going to give you something to cry about if you keep crying, right? So what they're doing now is they're shutting down the expression, the full expression of the childhood emotion, which stored it, and now I'm going to have to release that at another time. And so if we understand that all of this emotion, this so-called emotional processing we need to do, is just all about releasing stored emotion that through our life we, cho we chose to store rather than experience. And what generally happens when we decide then oh, okay I'm going to start releasing these emotions I'll look at my law of attraction we, we recognize oh, that's triggered something but suddenly I can't get to my tears or I can't get to my fear and that's because we have this whole other layer which is our emotional blocks which is all the things we were told when we were a kid if you cry I'll give you something to cry so then we have to release the fear that we have about crying if I cry I'll get harmed further so we have to release that emotionally in order for us to get down to our tears so sometimes it seems like when we start this process we're not getting anywhere because we're not crying or we're not feeling it but it's because we we need to recognize there's reasons why we're not doing it we're blocked and that's an emotional thing as well and if we just are gentle with ourselves in that process and go okay there's a reason why I'm not crying what is the reason and try and work through that emotionally it eventually becomes quite easy so really you have a layer of emotions which are your causal emotions, which are the ones that will change your law of attraction. Then you have a layer of emotions which we which would call the law of compensation type emotions, which are the emotions that enter your soul as a result of you doing things unloving in your life or choosing to do things unloving in your life. Then you have a layer of emotions which we would call blockages, fears about dealing with the under, those, those two emotions underneath. So they might be, you know, I'm afraid of crying because if I cry, my mum and dad ta taught me that my backside hurts when I, cr when I cry too much because they just give me a belting every time I cry. So this fear then is inside of me. Does that make sense? So that's my blockage emotion. Then we have a layer of emotion that we create, which we don't ever need to experience, which I'd call our emotions of self-deception. Right? These are, the, they are a group of emotions we create so we don't have to do all of the others. <laughs> and then, of course, we go into our intellect. So there's a whole layers of Im groups of emotions, if you like, that we need to dig down to. The actual act of feeling your blockages is a part of the process, just like the act of looking at your intellect is a part of the process. So your act of looking at your intellectual denial is a good part of the process because while you have the intellectual denial, you'll not get to the underlying emotion. And then when you work through your intellectual denial, then there's this emotional denial that you need to work through. Does that make sense? Yeah. Once you allow yourself to feel this emotional denial, then you're through that layer and then you get down to some law of compensation or emotions or, or causal emotion and experience those. And from a, a slightly different perspective, um, from the perspective of, of a child or an adolescent, 
when should we uh, encourage them to process their emotions? Like, for instance, if you had a toddler, toddler you know, throwing a tantrum somewhere, uh -huh. you know, do you just walk away and let them go? Or yeah, you, you know encourage them from? to process their emotion then and there, just like you should be doing <laughs> yourself. <laughs> but the, the question is born again from an emotional injury, and that is, oh, it's going to look pretty messy, and what will other people think? And, and, you know, I'll be judged as a parent, and you know what I mean? And then all these other things flick in, and then so we try to shut down the child. But in reality, we need to learn to do exactly what the two-year-old does, feel your emotions when it's created. Because if you feel it when it's created, you're not going to store it. And it's the storage of it that damages your law of attraction and damages the rest of your life, in fact. Yeah. So let yourself feel the emotion when it's there. In fact, if you do not feel your emotion when it's there, you'll find it much more difficult to get to that emotion at a second bite later later on so what i've found myself is every time i've denied the emotion at the time that it should have occurred when i actually felt it when i went back into it in my imagination you know put myself back into that place it was always much more difficult to access and uh, and so after a while you learn try to never do that you know like because it just makes it all much more difficult so we should be encouraging our, our kids to, to experience their emotions now. Yes. Now, there are ways of experiencing their emotion that doesn't damage other people. So it, let's say they feel angry with their brother. So they're a 15-year-old, he's angry with his 13-year-old you know, brother. What do we do? Well, if we've got a boxing bag out the back with a baseball bat, we say instead of you projecting all of your anger at your brother, you go and own your anger out in the boxing bag. And he can go out in the box and bag and he's allowed to swear about his brother and curse his brother and bash the bag as much as he wants, right? As long as he's not projecting out the brother. And then teach him how to actually dig and feel deeper than that. Every time you're angry with your brother, there's a, something inside of you that, he's, that you're feeling that you're not identifying. We want to find out what that is. We want you to talk to us about what that is. And he might realise after a while of bashing it, you know, his brother gets everything brand new because he's older, you know, and he always gets second hand, you know, like that might be the emotion he's feeling, right? So once, once, he, once he can feel that emotion, he can express that to you and you can work through it lovingly. Mm. And stepping outside the family circle, helping other people, we should be helping them to allow their emotions. Exactly. But the, the fastest way to do that is if you allow your own emotions everyone around you will automatically feel like they're allowed to feel their emotions when they're with you. Does that make sense? So if you're shutting down yourself emotionally and then saying to your neighbour, oh, you need to open up emotionally, <laughs> uh, really your emotions are saying to your brother, you need to shut down emotionally, right? So they're getting a very mixed message from you if you're not allowing your own emotions. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Any other questions? Yeah, in front here. Oh, no, you're all right. You're, you're good. What's your job? I was just going to say... Uh, microphone up. It has to be up. That's it. I know you don't like it, but we want to hear you. <laughs> I have difficulty remembering what I wanted to say now. Um, I was going to ask, did it take you leaving the earth before and coming back to experience what you now know, or did you know it then? Because that's not the message we got. That is not the message we got when you were on earth before. So, Good question, yeah. Mm. Um, I did know about emotions in the first century, obviously. And in fact, if you read some Bible texts, you'll see that I talked a lot about emotions and how emotions affect people. In fact, uh, I can quote some of them to you if you want, but um, where, where I was actually speaking about a person's emotional soul condition. So I often spoke about soul condition and how it affected them. The thing that I didn't understand very well at the time was how to actually work through these emotions from a state where you were embroiled in the emotion. Because I was never embroiled in the emotion. So I never really understood very well what a person needed to do to work through an emotion from a state of, let's call it sin, from a state of where you were so embroiled in the emotion you believed the emotion to be true. And what I've learned this life is that how you can actually work through the emotion, identify the emotion, work through the emotion, coming from a state of error rather than coming from a state of truth. It wasn't while you were in the spirit world? 
it was coming back yeah. as a second. Yeah.